We're talking obviously about what happened uh, and the data that you have received from MH370. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the plane communicated with your satellite. Uh, yes, exactly. And when it communicated, what was it saying? Well, essentially, there was no communication initiated from the plane itself um, during the period that the, after the plane was uh, essentially came off the radar system. There's essentially three types of information we have. We have actually there were messages from the ground station to the plane and back again. That essentially tells you the terminal is switched on and powered up. Um, we have some timing information in the messages and that allows you to essentially work out the distance from the satellite and we could see that the plane was essentially moving, that distance was changing, so allowed you to uh, essentially work out some arcs on the Earth's surface where the plane was at any particular time. And in addition to that there were some uh, frequency measurements which allowed you to try and determine or allowed you to see what the frequency that the ground station received these messages at as opposed to what uh, they probably expected. In many ways, you, all three pieces of those information are really quite important. To an, I mean, not to necessarily understanding, but to the whole picture. In the end, yes, they are. They are. But they are contained deep inside some very complex logs, uh, sort of communication logs like this, which allows you to see the individual messages passed between the ground station and the terminal and the aircraft and back again. Now, when people are talking about raw data, mm -hmm. This is what they're talking it's about. It's essentially the communication log between the ground station and the plane, yes. A piece of paper like this has not been released with the data. Mm -hmm. Why not? Well, I think that data itself, it, by, in standalone, is fairly, uh, fairly opaque and not particularly, uh, you can't draw too much from it. What uh, I think is more pertinent is to be able to see the messages and to see the important bits of information. And uh, that's the job that we've been trying to do and some explanation behind uh, how the numbers are used. So what did you do with those numbers once you had them? We first looked at the timing information. Uh, this timing information was actually put in uh, as a consequence of Air France. And essentially what that allows you to do uh, is to determine the range, the distance from the satellite to where the plane is uh, reasonably accurately. Um, so for each, each data exchange then you get a position uh, a distance from the satellite and allowing you to draw these, these arcs. So we, we have some arcs here. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that we have to pass the arc at a particular time. Yes. That's a known. That's a known. That's a known as a result of the, uh, this, uh, the, timing, this, information. the timing information. Mm -hmm. So you've got to cross these arcs at a particular time. Exactly. That's not a... a but where on the arc yes. is the important bit. Right. So if you start on, say this is arc one, arc two, and arc three in this case, you, you have a position on the arc. Mm -hmm. To get to the next point on the arc, you have to get there a certain time. So you can either travel slowly, and get there in the direct route. You can't go any slower than that, otherwise you'll never reach the arc. You can't go faster than the plane can travel, so that will bound where you get to the next arc up here. So you, then you can pick some n normal type of cruising speeds, and that will give you a range of locations on the arc. But there are a variety of different ones, but you're saying your, si your, your data uh, only allows really for one particular option, one particular choice. In terms of uh, a north or south yeah. direction, yes. and. And where on the arc? Essentially what you, so the where on the arc you cross right. is to do with the speed. Then you take the second piece of data. So yeah, so after you had the arcs developed, then we were started looking at the, the frequency measurements of the messages um, and sort of developing a model to allow you to work out what frequencies you would expect for aircraft in different positions, different headings, different speeds. Uh, and then you can use that model to compare it against what actually the measured values were. Right, this is the so-called Doppler. Mm -hmm. But you knew that this was something that had not been done before. I mean, it had come close with Air France, but this had not been done before. In this way, no, in turning this particular communication system into a navigation system, um, no, it hadn't been done before, and we had to check and make sure we understood the system and double check and get other people to check for us as well, as all these things. Validation is very important when it comes to making sure you have confidence in what you've done. What you're saying is, as I understand it, you're pretty certain the, the route the plane took as a result of the time and the Doppler on the arcs. 
in the grand in when you look at all the data together, yes, I think there's a good confidence that we've uh, understand the data and we've modelled it correctly. It's important that you validate any model you generate. Obviously, there's other flights in the air at the same time. There's other flights of the same aircraft in previous days. So you, you develop this model and you can apply it to these other aircraft with known locations, known speeds, known headings, uh, and you check that the model gives you the right the numbers you'd expect versus what you've measured as a validation. Are you saying? that as a result of the other tests that you did with other known aircraft on different days, you know, it worked then, there's no reason why this one shouldn't have worked now. It's, it that isn't right I, now. The, the, no one's come up yet with a reason why it shouldn't work for this particular flight when it works for the others. And it's very important that this isn't just an IMAS at activity, there's other people doing uh, in the investigation, uh, experts who are helping the investigation team who got the same data, Work, they made their own models up and did the same thing and see if they get the same results. And, brought, and speaking, uh, broadly speaking, for the teams, we get the, roughly the same answers. What did you think when you got the data and you started the modelling, you're putting it in and you suddenly realise where this plane probably went? Let's check this and let's check it again. Because you want to make sure when you come to a conclusion like that, that you've done the right work the data is as you understand it to be. <coughs> was there a moment of disbelief? Was there a moment of, th th this, can't, th 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 <laughs> this, can't, this can't be right? Well, I, I, well, having messages for six hours after the plane is lost is probably the biggest disbelief in terms of what you have. Um, the rest is trying to just work out what happened during those six hours. As this data has been released, will people be able to take this data and recreate your work? No, this is, you need uh, a lot of engineering expertise from different fields. This has taken people from with satellite engineering, modem engineering, terminal engineering, um, to be able to help build up especially the, the Doppler part to make sure that we understand how each component works. Um, so it's not something you can just pick up and, and run with and, and generate the same numbers. Uh, you need to have a uh, good understanding of all the components that's involved. Of course, one of the things everybody wants to do, of course, is take the data and try, and, sure. and, try and do it do it themselves. They're going to be disappointed. Well, the, it's, a, it's a pretty tricky thing to do, and that's why we've had lots of experts from around the world essentially doing it and, and making sure that it's done correctly. To be clear, you're letting people make judgments on your work. You're not inviting them to redo your work. No, I, as I say, the, the, to redo the work requires experts in many, many different fields. Um, we gathered those experts within the investigation team to allow that to happen. Uh, but this is providing some transparency in terms of what actually data came back and forth between the plane and the ground station and how that data has been subsequently used. Has Inmarsat got this right? And are you prepared to consider that you haven't? always prepare consider you haven't but this data has been checked and checked not just by Marsat by many parties who've done the same work with the same numbers to make sure we've got it got it right checked against other flights in the air at the same time checked against previous flights of this aircraft at the moment there's no reason to doubt I believe what the data says the whole weight of the search for this plane is resting on, for want of a better phrase, the Inmarsat data. Mm -hmm. The Inmarsat calculations, whatever we want to call it, if that's the name it's been given. Mm -hmm. The Inmarsat handshakes, mm -hmm. whatever. How aware are you of that? Oh, absolutely. And I think everyone in the investigation team or who are working with this understand what it means. Uh, it means this is all the data that we have for what's happened for those six or so hours. Uh, it's important that we all get it right that everyone's looking at the data, make the, uh, makes the best judgments on it and how it's used, and particularly trying for the families um, and friends of the relatives on board, try and make sure that we can help try and bring this uh, sad incident to a close. Have you ever done anything like this before? No, this isn't close to my day job. This is, for searching missing planes, I think is something very few people do. Or ever have to do again. I, well, I hope never have to do it again.